1 BC, near the small village of Galgamela, in present-day Iraq, two vast forces of men are engaged in a battle for the future of the world. On one side is the great king of Persia, Darius, commander of the largest army on Earth. He probably had 200 to 250,000 men on the field. On the other side is an army one-fifth the size, led by a 26-year-old named Alexander. He was, at this point in his young life, a veteran commander. Prepare to experience the greatest battle of the ancient world like never before. Witness firsthand the innovative strategies and weapons of war. They'd have a weapon much like this, a very aerodynamic spear. Who was Alexander? How could he possibly face an army five times his number? His tactics are still in use today. His ideas are still in use today. What was Alexander's secret weapon? Alexander was a phenomenon. Go back in time and experience one of the world's greatest battles. Gagamela was a turning point in world history. The lines have been drawn, the odds impossible. Prepare for battle. It's a fight to the finish that will change history forever and define one young man as Alexander Kowage! the Great. October 1st, 331 BC, near the village of Gagamela. The two most powerful armies in the world, the Persians and Macedonians, are about to clash. The Macedonian army moves first, even though they are outnumbered five to one. Their young leader, Alexander, orders his elite troops to attack the center of the Persian line. What was at stake at Gaugamela was the entire Persian Empire. Darius, king of Persia, has no intention of losing his empire. He had lost before to Alexander at the Battle of Issus. Now, he is determined to crush the boy king. Darius orders his men to attack Alexander's left flank. Darius was setting a trap, and he was forcing Alexander to march right into it. The Persian king orders the release of his most deadly weapons, war chariots, designed to slice the enemy to pieces. If you're Alexander, what are you gonna do against something like that? Facing incredible odds and terrifying weapons, will Alexander be able to save his men and his kingdom? The story of Gaugamela really began in a small backwater of the ancient world a region north of the Greek peninsula called Macedon. This mountainous region was considered barbaric by the Greeks because it was a monarchy, not a democracy. And from childhood on, the boys of Macedon, like Alexander, were raised to be warriors. No! Fali! Fali, Nexakis! Alexander was familiar with the, the great heroes of uh, Homeric legend, and he came from a society that valued those, those heroes. They, they reveled in anything which, which demonstrated their personal courage. Alexander's father was King Philip of Macedon. A grizzled veteran of tribal wars, he was a student of the art of war. Philip's leadership and army unified the people of Macedon. He had made Alexander a cavalry commander at age 16. Philip was not only a brilliant statesman, but a brilliant innovator. What Philip did was to remake Macedonia into the most powerful state in the ancient world. He literally changed the way armies were organized and the way they fought. Phil creates an army of professionals. He actually pays them and pays them well. They drilled year round and they were in units along with people from uh, their home regions. So they were very cohesive and they were very well trained and therefore much more maneuverable. With Macedon transformed into a regional power, Philip now intended to unify all of Greece 
under his command. Arminio, Rasta Pragmata. Oi, Athanaio, Kehoi, Voi Tute. Sumi Mackensen. Co pro foi esso, tus Athanaius. Oposun epithoso, sun capsumen et kainos. Catastasos Alexandron. Hegemon ton hippon. Ectoimos est di. The other formative force in the life of Alexander was his mother, Olympias. The daughter of a conquered king, she became Philip's bride as a spoil of war. Her relationship with Philip was uh, rocky at best. She had sort of been cast aside in favor of another more beautiful new wife. And so you might say Alexander had some resentment because he felt that his mother had been wrongfully denied a certain privileged place. Olympias might even have feared that this new wife would produce a son and who Philip would then favor as his heir rather than favoring Alexander. In 336 BC, destiny changed Alexander's life when Philip of Macedon was assassinated. For Macedon and the young Alexander, this would mean one thing. Philip's death did not stop the Macedonian plans for conquest. Just 20 years old, Alexander took control of the army and marched on Greece, which rebelled after Philip's death. Athens and the other city-states surrendered to the young king. The Macedonian army was unstoppable. Next, Alexander turned his attention east to Persia. The Persian Empire was, in its day, the greatest empire in history. There had never been anything like this, as big as the Persian Empire, as organized as the Persian Empire. At its height, it stretched from the Indo-Pakistani border in the east all the way to Macedon. And in the south, it included Egypt. Persians and the Greeks had been at war in one way or another uh, since about 550 BC, so for well over 200 years. Persia had invaded Greece, had conquered Macedonia, had burned Athens to the ground, had violated the temples of the gods. Alexander grew up with the idea that the ultimate grand prize was the Persian Empire. In 334 BC, Alexander led his army of 45,000 men east into the lands claimed by the Empire of Persia. Legend says that while marching through the center of present-day Turkey, Alexander visited a temple outside the town of Gordium. The temple was the home of a famous riddle, the Gordian Knot, an ancient puzzle created by the gods. A knot so intricate that whoever untied it would become Lord of Asia. This was an irresistible challenge for Alexander, who had already declared that he would conquer the continent. In those days, particularly for a guy like Alexander, who was steeped in the Iliad and the whole heroic tradition, if you were a king, you were supposed to go out and conquer the world. Eloton peridei ugedlum, mitinakai todo etus polus kinse igresete. Epilaxman epitus sacros, to this mu epiteluse sum bebecotos, Basilius con macadon, con henegan con helenan, mikeerjo te sasias. The inner plane that he dwelt on 
was populated by Achilles, Hector, Heracles, the great heroes. And that was what he wanted to do. He wanted to leave a name that would never die to accomplish things that no one had ever done before. Opus Mendi in Parcate. Tuavi de Desmond. Etus Pulus is Kisate. Human legacy and hot de paisas. So Desmond Kyle Lusta Ife. to Estora. To Ramu. Whether or not the story is true, I think it tells us something about the nature of Alexander, his character, that he was willing to look for inventive and new solutions. And even more than that, that he was driven to succeed. Historians argue over whether the story of the Gordian Knot is true or simply a myth. No! But there is no debate about Alexander's legendary drive and genius. It would now be tested in one of the most important battles in the history of the ancient world. Alexander is now on a collision course with the Persian Empire. Soon, a battle will begin for control of the known world at a place called Galgamela. Ah! Ah! In 334 BC, Alexander led his army of 45,000 men east into the lands claimed by the Empire of Persia. But the invasion was barely noticed by the Persian king. Darius III was the great king of Persia. He came to the Persian throne in 336 BC. Die. Darius is told that Alexander and his army have breached Persian soil. The question now is what to do about it. The Persians want to have an early victory against Alexander. Nip it in the bud. Fight him uh, before he can advance far from where he's landed. But the Persian strategy backfires. They're defeated at the Battle of Granicus at the Battle of Issus, and at the Siege of Tyre. Alejandros. As Darius watched the surprising military success of the young general, he began to build up his army. Many of his advisors said, don't fight regular battles with the Macedonian army. They're simply too good. The risk of losing is too great. Instead, avoid battle and retreat. Let the formidable terrain of Southwest Asia defeat Alexander, destroy all the food, burn all the crops, give him nothing to eat. And that will be a, a, go a long way towards defeating him. That kind of policy is very difficult uh, for Darius to follow because he needs to prove himself. And traditionally, a Persian king proves himself by winning battles. But before a final showdown with Alexander, Darius decided to negotiate instead of fight. Darius sent several notes to Alexander, offering him peace treaty and various terms. He told Alexander that if he would stop campaigning, that Darius would give him money, would give him half of his empire that he had already conquered up to that point, and even the hand of his daughter in marriage. Alexander, in response, is said to have sent back letters saying, in effect, basically, why should I negotiate with you for something which already belongs to me? Patipur. Kushiata Pusaraka. Patipur! Alejandros Prostarion Graffi. Ine yata ta krema ta katin korana tu pasan. What was at stake at Galgamela was the entire Persian Empire. If Alexander could bring Darius to battle and defeat him, he would lay honest claim to rule of the Persian Empire. Kautitaja Ijaka Abarana. Gagomela Kruciata Buzaraka. Gagamela. At this time, 
Adahan, Avarang, Agalgamela! Darius had built an army from every corner of his empire. And as the Persian army began to move into place, Greek scouts reported that Darius's army was larger than anything they had ever seen before. The estimates are actually all over the field, but uh, we, we suspected he probably had around 200 to 250,000 men on the field, which would have been about five times the size of Alexander's force. The Macedonian army, we, we think we have fairly certain figures for. We're talking about 40,000 infantry of all types and about 7,000 cavalry. Alexander's chief general is Parmenio, a seasoned cavalry commander. Parmenio was uh, one of Philip's most trusted generals. He was also of the old school. He was one of the only generals that regularly stood up and argued with Alexander. And in some cases, Alexander would, would ask Parmenio for, uh, for advice, knowing that he would get a conservative answer from Parmenio. And therefore, he would understand how a conservative commander would view a certain situation. And oftentimes, he would then use that information to develop a plan that would counter a conservative reaction. The youthful Alexander may not be worried about being outnumbered five to one, but the old general is. He wants to attack at night while the enemy sleeps. Tigar, a pelicanai planastai ki poye ke ki farme ora derian. Egoman an Alexandros, egoman an es. Kaigo. E permenian en. I look ego permenian. E klepto teniken. Tu pame tu porri. He was arrogant and brash, but he had to be to lead in that kind of an environment. Darius had expected an attack in the dark and left his army standing at the ready for the entire night. It was not a cohesive force, but a series of armed groups levied from the governors or satraps of every corner of the empire. The king would go to the satrap and say, your tax this year is a thousand men. And he might have a huge variety of these from different places. He fought with Ethiopians. He fought with Bactrians, who would be Afghanistan today. They were all over the place, and they may speak different languages, have different cultures, have different weapons. Most Persian warriors wore no armor and no helmet. Each carried an eight-foot spear and a shield made of wicker. But what the Persian army lacked in armor and weapons, they made up for in numbers. You think of the Persians, they're not a bunch of yahoos. The tactics that they're using have been effective for hundreds of years. The Persians have a huge empire. It's been good enough. Against this enormous army, Alexander has one advantage. Hot! This professional army has the Macedonian phalanx. Captain Dale Dye, retired officer, historian, and film consultant, has studied the Macedonian approach to warfare. The Macedonian phalanx, probably the most potent weapon of war in the ancient world. The phalanx, blocks of individuals, 256 men, arranged 16 across by 16 deep. Once you were in the formation and going forward, you really had no choice as to whether you were going to go backwards or not. You were definitely going forward with this massive wall of human muscle and spear points, and that's what made it so overwhelming. In the front rank were the most veteran fighters, the fighters who had proved their courage, their bravery on the battlefield, who could be relied on to go forth and contact the enemy. He carried a small shield the shield was suspended by a strap from his neck so that it would help support the weight. More importantly, that would allow his left hand, his shield hand, to be free. Not grasping the shield, but free so that he could reach over and grasp his primary weapon. And his primary weapon was the sarissa. Now, we believe sarissas were somewhere between 16 and 18 feet long. 
Up to this point, the principal combatants were carrying seven to eight foot spears. Philip gave the infantry longer spears. His phalanx now had greater standoff than the average uh, Greek or Persians would have. Think this way. 256 sarissas, 16 to 18 feet long, in front of the phalanx. A bristling hedgehog of spear points that the enemy could not get under, around, or over. How intimidating was the phalanx? Let's take a look at what a Persian trooper might have seen. Phalanx, battle positions, move! Ah! At dawn on the morning of October 1st, 331 BC, the phalanx began to form on the battlefield at Gagamela. Arrayed to the right of the phalanx was generally a unit of heavy infantry, what the Greeks called hoplites. They carried a large shield, unlike the smaller phalangite shield. The shield was known as a hoplon. In combat, it could be used to bludgeon the enemy, back him up, knock him over, which would provide time for the hoplite to use his primary sidearm, a sword. In many cases, a leaf blade sword like this, a short sword, unlike the medieval cleavers that you see. This was a short sword designed to do butchery in tight. The hoplite could hide his weapon so that you had no idea where he was going to strike. He didn't advertise what he was going to do with the weapon. He could come in low or he could come in high. He was not in the mood to sword fight with an enemy. He was in the mood to use his large hoplon shield to push that enemy back to keep progressing, to never lose his own momentum, so that if the enemy should stumble or get his feet tangled up, he was on the ground. And when he was on the ground, the hoplite took care of him. With the armies in place, the battle lines at Gaugamela have now been drawn. Darius was apparently planning Gaugamela to be the final battle. This is a turning point for Alexander and the future of the world. The Persians have brought together the largest army ever formed, perhaps as many as a quarter of a million men. The army of Alexander consists of just 45,000. The stakes were high. For Darius, he knew that if he lost this battle, he would probably lose his empire. For Alexander, the stakes were high too. He had staked everything on defeating Darius and becoming the king of, of Persia. Alexander risks everything on this one battle. If he wins, the richest empire on earth will be his. If he loses, 45,000 men will be slaughtered, and Greece will be open to invasion. A 26-year-old is about to fight a battle that will determine the future of two continents. Alexander the Great and his army of 45,000 Macedonians face a Persian army that is nearly five times their number. Their army's best warriors stretch in an unbroken line for two and a half miles. While concerned with the numbers, Alexander trained his men for just such an encounter. laid out his battle line in a way that was a tremendous challenge for anybody. It was two and a half miles long, and there were fairways, killing zones, laid out for scythe chariots. Chariots with iron blades on the front and on the sides. 
the Macedonians, no matter how far they stretched out their line, they still were going to be overlapped by about a half a mile. So Alexander was walking into a double envelopment where Darius was going to send his cavalry from each side while he was sending these scythe chariots at Alexander. But if you're Alexander, what are you going to do against something like that? Alexander viewed each battle as if it were a chess game, and he knew this would be a difficult match. Alexander viewed his army metaphorically as a hammer and an anvil. The phalanx would serve as the anvil. His cavalry, the hammer, would push the enemy. So between the hammer and the anvil, the enemy force would be crushed. In every previous battle, Alexander's hammer and anvil tactics had worked flawlessly. But at Gaugamela, this approach was useless. With a Persian line stretching for over two miles, Alexander's cavalry could not possibly outflank the enemy. He would have to come up with an entirely new strategy. First, he grouped his infantry into the phalanx formation. 256 warriors to a square, 16 across, and 16 deep, and nearly impossible to stop. This approach to warfare was new to the ancient world. Next, how best to utilize his other great asset, his cavalry. Armed like no other and trained to work as a unit, the riders of Macedonia were considered the finest horsemen in the world. Alexander's cavalrymen wore bronze helmets and breastplates. Each was armed with a lance called a ziston. The lance was approximately 10 feet long. The average cavalry lance was more like six feet long, which gave a reach so that you could contact the enemy before he could contact you. The cavalrymen also carried a curved single-edged sword called a kopis. Kopis is a great weapon much more sophisticated than the leaf blade we saw the infantry have. Because of this heavy belly, because of the metal here, and the thinness and lightness here, when you slash, that momentum gives you a lot of power, like a machete or an ax. You can do a lot of damage, hacking and cutting. Great for hamstringing. Alexander's challenge is how best to utilize the phalanx and cavalry to his advantage. And what he does next will turn traditional strategy on its head. Rather than face the enemy head on, Alexander arranges for his outnumbered infantry to face the Persian center at an angle. He comes to the battlefield arrayed in what for the day seemed to be a strange formation. If we were to look at this in modern military terms, if we were to look at the way Alexander arrayed his Macedonian forces, we would say that he approached Darius's line of battle in a left echelon formation with his left flank refused. The modern military terms mean that the Macedonian phalanx were arrayed at an angle with the left side facing outward away from the battle expecting an attack from the side. And the echelon or angled line of attack couldn't help but confuse the enemy who had never seen such an approach to battle before. The Macedonian front line begins to march toward the enemy. On the front line of the Persian force are the immortals, Darius's elite guard. If one was killed, somebody else stepped up and got in their place. That's why they were known as the immortals, because they were always 10,000 no matter what you did. As the Macedonians get closer, Darius believes Alexander's angled approach has given the Persians an enormous advantage. Darius sees the open ground between the Persian cavalry and Alexander's troops. Alexander's a smart tactician. He knew that if you offer a cavalry heavy force open ground, that cavalry will charge across that open ground. It was a given in Alexander's mind that if he offered that open ground, Darius would take advantage of it. And he was right. Darius orders his cavalry to charge the Macedonian left. The Macedonian left flank is under the command of Parmenio. He awaits the charge, 
knowing that his task is to keep the Persian line engaged. And on the other side of the Macedonian line, the young king does something completely unexpected. He turns his cavalry to the right. In an unexpected move, particularly unexpected to King Darius, Alexander begins to ride parallel to the line of battle. A curious move in the eyes of Darius, who's concerned that Alexander might ride off of the prepared battlefield at Galgamela. Or, more likely, Alexander might outflank him, might be able to turn to the left and ride down his flank thus carving him up in detail. So Darius can't tolerate this. He sends signals to his cousin Bessus, commander of the Bactrian cavalry, the heavy cavalry on the Persian left. He says, stop that. Bessus makes his move with his cavalry. They begin to ride parallel with Alexander. This unorthodox tactic is unsettling to Darius, but he has little time to be concerned. For in the center of the battlefield, the unbreakable phalanx of Alexander's army is about to clash with the elite guard of the Persian force. And now, two empires, two continents, and two armies meet head on with the fate of the world in the balance. The battle has begun. October 1st, 331 BC, the outnumbered army of Alexander the Great is about to collide with the army of the Persian King Darius. The battle is underway. As the center and right clash, Alexander and his companion cavalry continue to ride to the right while the Persian cavalry matches their every move. But Alexander has a hidden advantage. Running on foot between the horses of the cavalry is a complete regiment of Peltists, Alexander's light infantry. Peltists were the skirmishers who were seen all around the battlefield, in and out, uh, with lots of a variety of weapons. And when they hit you with stuff, they pelt you. So we still use that word today, from the Peltists, lobbing you with sticks and stones. Now they used several weapons, these Peltists. They used short bows, short range arrows. They used javelins. They'd have a weapon much like this, a light, very aerodynamic spear. Not designed so much for range, but designed for velocity. From that, we get this sort of thing, Charles, thank you. This is the modern scholastic competition, Olympic style competition, javelin. Thing to remember is, from that came this. How effective are they? Let's see. So javelins were used by pelters, by skirmishers, out in front of the battle line to pick off high-value targets, those officers, those chariot crews, and to keep the enemy on edge, unbalanced. One of the other weapons that they used was really quite common to the era. It was called the sling. They might look something like this, a very simple piece of gear, a leather pouch sewn so as to give it a pocket to contain the missile or the rock, and two plated or braided lengths which would serve to launch the missile. Now, that stone may not look like it have injured anyone downrange, but imagine this. Two or three hundred peltists, all armed with these slings, all throwing metal objects or rocks into the enemy line of battle. Somebody's gonna get hurt, or more importantly, Somebody's gonna get rattled. With the Peltists hidden from the Persians, Alexander moves steadily across the battlefield. The hidden Peltists will be one of the keys to Alexander's strategy 
to win the battle. As Alexander rides, the front line of the Persian army begins to feel the full power of the Macedonian phalanx. Seeing his elite troops pushed back, Darius decides to deploy his most feared weapon, the scythe chariot. A scythe chariot was basically a two-wheeled chariot with scythes, so blades attached to the wheels, so they stuck out horizontally, so they would cut down people who they hit. 200 scythe chariots, the supreme weapon of the Persian army, burst forth from Darius's front line. Most opposing commanders might have seen only two defenses against this onslaught. Either stand their ground or retreat before the giant blades and regroup later. But Alexander had devised a brilliant tactic to defeat them. Darius launches his chariots. Alexander knew it was coming, and he had taught his men to trap the chariots. It's a simple move that is still analyzed in tactical studies today, a move that is called the mouse trap. No horse is going to come toward a bristling line of men with sharp pointy sticks. So if you open a space, that horse will come into that space. He will be trapped. You can gut the horses, you can pull the charioteers down and kill them. And that's what he did. In a sort of tactical judo, the Macedonians use the chariot's own momentum against them. Within minutes, the threat from the Persian chariots is neutralized. The chariot will never be used again as a significant weapon of war. As the battle rages on, Parmenio's left flank is under heavy attack and is near collapse. On the other side of the battlefield, Alexander continues to ride away from the fight. But why? The Battle of Gaugamela has reached a critical juncture. The Macedonian phalanx are engaged on the front line, while Alexander continues to ride across the battlefield on the Macedonian right. And on the Macedonian left flank, Parmenio is in trouble. His outnumbered troops are on the verge of collapse. He attempts to contact Alexander, asking for reinforcements, but his message does not get through. Battlefield communication in ancient warfare was primitive at best. They had trumpeters who would play a certain set of notes and you would hear those set of notes and recognize it as a signal for your unit. And then the second set of notes that they would play would be what your unit is to do. You had drums whose beat could change, which would tell you that you need to increase the pace or you need to turn left or you need to turn right. It was very difficult and it was probably very, very confusing. The fog of war and the rattle of battle was a literal problem in those days. Communication was tough. While Parmenio struggles, Alexander and his cavalry continue to ride to the right, neither charging nor retreating. Darius's cavalry keeps pace to prevent the Macedonians from attacking his flank. Alexander angled his force farther and farther and farther off of the killing zone, and he actually went kind of out of the whole prepared field that Darius had set up for him, making Darius pull cavalry out of his line to keep from being outflanked. And as Darius pulled that cavalry out of his line, the line thinned out in the middle. And as that happens, the center of the Persian line cannot shift left to cover the hole that's left. Alexander then spots the gap in the Persian line of battle. Alexander's unorthodox approach to the battle has thrown the Persian army into disarray and has opened a gap in their line. But how can he exploit it? Like all great field commanders, he feels, he feels the moment when that door opens. Kuwait! El Dorado! In an amazing move, Alexander turns his entire cavalry 160 degrees and charges toward the gap in the Persian line. The hidden peltists now emerge and attack the Persian horsemen in a hail of slings, javelins, and arrows, preventing the Persian horsemen from pursuing Alexander and his cavalry. 
I'm sure that from Darius's point of view, he must have been sitting there, sending his side chariots out, sending his cavalry out, and just waiting for Alexander to be steamrolled over. And then suddenly he looked up, and there was Alexander's companion cavalry. Alexander personally was at the apex of the cavalry wedge. In every battle, he was in harm's way. Alexander and his cavalry charge into the gap forcing their way through the line. The phalanx is the anvil. The cavalry is now the hammer. The Persian infantry is smashed between them. The Macedonian phalanx find no resistance. They charge forward. The Persian army breaks and begins to run. With the Persian center broken, Alexander has one goal now, the most ancient goal of all warfare, kill the king. The battle at Galgamala was fought with the idea that Alexander would meet Darius mano a mano, one on one, kill him, mount his head on a cavalry spike. Alexander realized that if you could kill, if you could cut the head off the snake, the rest of the snake would die. But just as Alexander was within striking distance of the fleeing Darius, a sudden change stops his pursuit. Alexander learns that Parmenio's troops are near collapse and may soon be overwhelmed. They need Alexander's help. Alexander must now make a decision that could change the outcome of the battle. Kill the king or save his troops. After Alexander breaks through the Persian front line, Darius turns and flees from Galgamela. Now, Alexander faces the decision of a lifetime. Alexander needed to chase Darius. He needed to behead him. He needed to kill him. Darius was nearly within Alexander's reach, yet the Macedonian left wing needed immediate help. It was a difficult choice for a 26-year-old intent on conquering the world. He made the smart decision. He turned, left Darius to flee, and saved his army. Alexander ran directly into a wall of confused soldiers falling to the rear. There's no question that he was an active fighting commander who went in harm's way and reveled in it. Alexander's rescue of Parmenio was one of the hardest fought parts of the battle. Alexander himself suffered combat wounds the equal of any of his veterans. For Alexander, the moment is bittersweet. He rescued his left. He saved his army. And he won the battle at Galgamela. By late afternoon, the battle was over, and the legend of Alexander had begun. Paracolo. 
For Alexander, the Battle of Gaugamela was, you might say, the final decisive battle. In fact, after this, Alexander begins to take for himself the titles of the Persian great king. Alexander continued traveling east, conquering the rest of the Persian Empire, crossing the deserts of present-day Afghanistan to conquer the armies of India. And the reason he kept going, I think, was that he just wanted to do things that nobody had ever done, to leave an undying fame and undying glory. He never lost a battle. He was the most successful commander that we study in the Western world. He was a brilliant tactician. He was a brilliant statesman. He was a charismatic individual that sort of exuded an aura about him of power. If I were making the list of great commanders, I would put Alexander at the top. I truly think he deserves the title great. Some sources say that over 1,000 Macedonians were killed at Gaugamela, while the Persian casualties may have been as high as 50,000. Darius escaped into the surrounding mountains, only to be murdered within the year by one of his own generals. Alexander declared himself Lord of Asia, and no one could deny that fact any longer. Alexander was great because he had such clarity in his goals. He managed to infect the people around him with such love for him and desire to accomplish his missions that it was a tidal wave of force that couldn't be stopped. And that's the mark of a great man. Alexander lived only six more years. And when he died at age 32, he had conquered the entire known world. The prophecy at Gordium turned out to be true. Alexander the Great's unusual strategies proved to be as effective against armies and empires as they were against the Gordian Knot. He was a heroic leader and he led a heroic people. And in a world that did not believe in an afterlife, how else does one achieve immortality than by writing oneself into the history books? And in that regard, Alexander is immortal. At the Battle of Gaugamela, a young man only 26 years old, had earned the title of Alexander the Great.